Today I'm going to talk about uh, Godot PlayFab, a little bit about me. Khalid has said something uh, already. Um, I'm the founder and game, gaming solution architect of Structure.me. I used to work at Microsoft um, as a gaming solution architect. I have been a game developer myself and worked in the C-sharp space a lot, also PHP. I did MMO games, right? And um, my last kind of role at Microsoft was a gaming solution architect where I helped like the really big publishers like do Azure stuff and uh, for gaming build infrastructure and uh, and so forth. And I kind of became the premier expert on PlayFab and now continuing as my own company. So I've uh, worked on, on things like Valheim uh, with Pictive to, to kind of integrate PlayFab Party. I'm now consulting on, on caged elements, Warmer 40K, Speed Freaks. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I do right now. But let's... Uh, yeah, I also do idea at Azure expert sessions and, and blog posts for them to, to kind of help to spread the word. But enough about that. Uh, today, we're going to talk about Godot PlayFab, which is the premier PlayFab SDK for, for the Godot engine. Uh, and it's now used by by uh, titles like, like Domekeeper. First, uh, let's talk a little bit about backends and why every, why every game needs one, right? Even a single player game because most people really think that only only multiplayer or a lot of uh, people think that that only multiplayer titles need a backend right they often think about uh, multiplayer service and so forth but what it's really about and that's why i think it's so important and is is other things right um and we 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 talk about this in a in a second but first what is a backend right it's a remote system that supports your game um, with things like analytics and 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 other things, right? And you can either build it your own by yourself, right? Which has a very high complexity. You need to invest a lot. You need to plan this, uh, and the investments not only include money but also obviously time and manpower. And you need to have a lot of exp expertise because when a game launches, um, we have hopefully all seen that if you're successful, right? You it can go through the roof and then scaling is so important and you can build it yourself right or you can buy one as a backend as a service or a boss uh, as i've uh, spelt it here um so what are the core components of that and and when we look at single player games i think the most important uh piece is analytics because when you build a game and you launch it then right and first you test it you want to understand your players and by that i really mean i you really want to understand where to invest right because today a game is a is often a multi year investment that you build you constantly test it in between already there you need to know uh where your players are going yeah um in in an open world for example world of warcraft everyone knows that um you want to to see in which regions players uh, walk around, right, and which interactions they make, right. And if you see that 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 players don't go to a specific location, then you have, um, if you have the data to to support um, that knowledge, right, then you can make a decision on whether you want to continue investing in that area and make it more interesting, right, and then watch how how that changes when, you, when you've implemented something more interesting according to yourself, or you can stop uh, making it accessible, right? And, and just neglect it at all, right? And divert your resources to somewhere else where it makes a lot more sense for you um, and for your players, obviously. And, and then sometimes you also want to segment your players, right? You want to understand who are your core players. Um, or how, who are your potentially churning players, right? That um, you you're about to lose because in today's world, when we have a multi-year investment into a game, um, you usually also have a multi-year investment afterwards, and uh, to make it really successful and um, really have your return on investment. And and for that reason, it's also very important to understand uh, those analytics, and it's important for your team to have an understandable system because you can have as much data as you want if you don't understand it and if you're not using it, right? 
and this is where we really get into story time, right? Because I have worked with a lot of uh, AAA um, game developers and publishers, and I've seen so many things like um, many companies are collecting a ridiculous amount of data and they have it, but they don't do anything with it because they sometimes they say, oh, we don't have the people uh, to analyze that data. Um, but really they are lacking, I think, systems to to analyze the data and make it easy for them, right? And then another story why I think backends are so important, and particularly analytics, is that um, I've I've talked to an indie developer and uh, they were about to go into a beta uh, phase for their game. And this, uh, this I, I asked them, what is your analytics story? Because you surely want to know where you're going to invest. That's the pur uh, purpose of the beta, right? Is to see where you're going with um, with your game, what you, uh, your players like and what they don't. And they said, and I couldn't believe it at first, right? But I've since heard this many times. Oh, I'm going to use Steam achievements. And I think that that is a horrible idea uh, because first you misusing a feature that you could other, otherwise use more more efficiently for your players, right? Because your players really expect nice achievements. Um, and also it's a lot of work to integrate them on, on the platform, right? And uh, you kind of restrict it in, in terms of what kind of payload you have, right? Um, but you really want to have a very easy and flexible solution to kind of like log anything or have have uh, events or analytics events sent to a backend platform arbitrarily. And you don't care in your game client. Um, you just want to have as much data as possible to analyze what's going on. OK. One other thing that, that I think is super important in terms of backends is for for single player games particularly as well right is balancing um, because all games really ha are are a lot of calculations and you have a lot of balancing variables and you don't want to update your client uh, just to to make balancing changes and in order to avoid that or specifically not when you when you do console releases because then you usually need to sim ship right across or simultaneous ship on on multiple platforms so um you don't want to have client updates and the easy way of doing that is using a backend right you have the initial values in your client right but whenever your game client is started it pulls new values from the backend if there are any and then it can cache them and 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 work with those right and this also not only enables you to to do easy updates but also see the implications right away and you can then track with your analytics implementation these effects and see whether you have done made a right choice or a wrong choice or how you can improve that and the last bit uh, i'm really adamant on on why backends are important is doing experiments or as some call it a b testing right um you want to to test out new balancing variables you want to test out new features right and um specifically together with with segmentation that you can do usually with analytics and player yeah player analytics you can determine a subset of players that you want to kind of push a certain feature or a certain balancing change to right and when you have like your your top 10 players right um or let's let's say you define a a group of insiders right you can kind of like as a player you can apply to be an insider right and you define an insider group and then you can say my insiders get the new beta feature right it's already in the new in the in the in the normal client but it will only be unlocked to uh, to those insiders, right? So you don't need to have a, spe a specific beta branch to test new features. You can just like remote enable and disable them. And you can then with your analytics implementation and really, really see how how it works for you and for the players, obviously. So let's talk a little bit about PlayFab and what a backend as a service is, right? PlayFab is a backend as a service. It is a hosted service um, that is free to play, uh, free to use up until one hundred thousand players, uh, with some restrictions in terms of multiplayer. But for like every 
single player game is it's way enough to do uh, to use that for development and for the initial stages and and even after that if you're not reaching 100,000 years it's it's uh, it's free of charge and after that it's super super cheap and if you're successful right it doesn't really matter right um, if it costs a little bit um so this is a backend as a service that you can easily use and and very easily integrate into um in yeah into your game right and this is where really good old playfab came into play because there wasn't an sdk when i started uh, messing with uh, with Godot, right? Where I wanted to build my first uh, side project game, and I wanted to integrate Playfab, right? And I kind of got into the position where I said, "Oh, there is no GD script plugin or SDK for Playfab, so yeah, let's build one, right?" And I also didn't want to auto generate it because I was kind of frustrated by the auto generated SDK. So I thought, like, developer experience is super important. So let's build my own SDK the way I want to use it. And that's how I got started with Godot Playfair. So let's get into demo time. I'm going to show you now um, the, 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 the Playfair over uh, like um, portal. So you get a kind of a feel um, of, Playfair, of what Playfair is. And then I'll show you how to integrate it. So you go to playfab.com and you can sign in with your Microsoft account. Um, I'm just going to skip that. Um, when you launch it, you don't you have an empty page here. Basically, you can create new studios, and within the studio, you can create a title. Um, you can see here it is currently in development mode. Um, I can have up to 100,000 users. This is a hard cap, so if you launch a game, you should upgrade the account. It still stay is um, free until 100,000 users. And the title ID, we need this later. Uh, but let's look into this. So first, you have a little dashboard where you can see a lot of like basic stats already. I'm doing this very quick because we have not a lot of time uh, to finish this. Uh, uh, excuse me. And you can always ask me questions afterwards. Um, if you look into players, right, you can um, create players and sign in players with any like platform uh, agnostic um, account, or you can create your own um, accounts anonymously or with um, email and password. And here I have a couple. Uh, this is my last logged in. Uh, you can already see some, some base data, like uh, how much they spend, because you can also integrate mobile payments like uh, Xola or Android or iOS payments and Steam, I think, as well. Um, you can see where they are from. I'm from Fürstenfeld Book in Germany. That's where I live. Um, and you can see already there's a lot of things like friends and and uh, and and inventories and and things like that. Files you can upload files here, like save games, for example, right? So this is pretty awesome. Um, you can just this is also great for live operations. You can just grant people uh, an item that you have defined. Um, Let's quickly look into into economy. This is uh, we're going to look at the legacy one uh, because that is that is often for single player things more useful. Um, you can define items. You can put them into drop tables or containers. You can think of boxes uh, like in Diablo, for example. You open a box. That's what you get out of it, right? Um, you can do stores. Again, Diablo, you have a, a vendor there. You can define that vendor store and then manipulate it. I think that's that's even for a single player game, this is this is an extremely cool thing to to be able to do. And really all the features in 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 Playfab, you you don't have to use them at face value. You can also kind of misuse them in a way if it fits your bill, right? There's also like content. This is where you have title data. Um, this is like balancing uh, variables. You can do this as key value pairs or as JSON objects here. You can also do title news. So these are news like change logs that you see in a main menu very often. You can do things like that, even localized um, in different languages. And a lot more. Um, here are also dashboards. I'm not going to go into this a lot. Um, but what I want to do more is, is events. So this is data um this is where you can actually see the 
the incoming event uh, analytics events. And this is what we're going to do here in in kind of the integration demo. I'm I'm going to start in a in a second. Is that we create our own PlayStream events um, that you can see coming in. Um, so this is the basic data explorer. You can also go advanced and have a pre-prepared that. You can also have like a SQL-like query language, Kusta query language, that you can use to to kind of um, dive into the data. And you can also render this and, and stuff. All right. Um, a quick word on events. Um, events, you can do two ways in PlayFab. So there's uh, telemetry events that are uh, ingested in not really real time, but like maybe a minute or two, or sometimes a little bit longer delayed. But you can then access them in the Data Explorer and kind of analyze it. There's the exact same API, but it's called um, a PlayStream. And these are in near real time. And you can use them to react in the backend, for example, or gift items, for example, right? Um, you can also see them coming in in near real time if someone adds an inventory item, for example, which I did. And you can then see the, the actual payload uh, directly. So this is kind of interesting to, to watch, right? Um, this API, if you're in the pay tier, is a little bit more expensive than the other one. So if you're just collecting data, you should always use the telemetry events. Um, this is also documented in the good old PlayFab docs, docs that you can find on the repo. All right, let's get started uh, with the demo. I've already prepared a little bit, like a very simple game uh, that was easy to implement. Uh, we are counting cats and dogs, right? Um, you can just like click this, you can reset it. We're not logged in right now. So when we look at the scene composition, there's just one, one scene. It has a main node that is a, a abstract control. We have attached a script to that, the main GD. And in that, we have a, a couple of um, layouts. I, I'd love to build this in real time, but the time will not be enough. I've tried it. I'm sorry. Uh, and because there are a lot of cool stuff uh, in, in Godot that I'd love to share to everyone who has not worked with Godot yet. Um, but yeah, we have a label here that says whether we're logged in. We have the cats button and the count label and so forth, right? What you can see here is um, this is a scene unique node. So you can define a node as scene unique. Um, over the context menu, this means that you can easily reference it in code by its very name instead of a path in the UI. The other thing is that signals are connected. Signals are a way in Godot to, to kind of like, it's the same, if you know C-sharp, it's the same like delegates uh, essentially, right? Um, where you can kind of like um, have an event triggered um, that then that you can observe them. So here I have um, connected, that's the that's the the term in Godot. I've connected this to this function, right? So let's look into the code real quick. So we have these event handlers uh, for the free token uh, for the free buttons, and we have the the count um, variables here. So this is GD script for everyone who's confused. Um, and this whole script extends control because that's the node type of this node. All right. So let's get started by adding Godot PlayFab. So we have the asset lib. It's kind of the equivalent to to a store. Um, and I've just did I just did a new release yesterday because I added a new convenience function. Uh, so this means I was lucky to to get in front here. So just click this, and then you can click download. It will download it. Um, we actually gonna. I made an error with packaging. I need to fix this. Uh, you have to deselect all of this, or you don't have to, but it's encouraged you do, uh, because you don't need all of this. There's a lot of examples and the actual source code of Godot PlayFab in it, and you don't need all of this. So just look at the repo if you want to see the examples. Uh, those are usually in scenes. Uh, the only thing you need is the add-ons Godot PlayFab uh, folder. So click Install. And you can see there's already a lot of errors. We ignore them. That's because um, the installation 
add something, an auto load. Ooh, damn it! I, I just killed it. Maybe. Uh, first, we need to enable the the plugin, and then we can go to auto load, and it adds an auto load. That's kind of like a a, a fake static um, a static instance, so to say. Okay. And then we also need to set exactly one setting and filter for playfab here. We need the title ID that we've seen earlier. So let's get this from here. You can find this in the URL or you can find this in studios, my studios and titles as well. It's the same here. Okay, just here. And we can go. So now it, it won't do anything, just the same. We need to hook this up in code. So let's go back to the script. And first, we obviously need to log into uh, PlayFab. So punk ready. That is the initial uh, function that is going to be called when this node is added to the scene tree. Um, so basically, when the script is first first run, to do this, uh, we're gonna access the the play fab manager, which has a client instance, and we do login anonymous. That's in fact all you need um, to to log in. But obviously. We want to know when we're logged in or whether an error occurred. And for that, we need to connect signals. So we're going to copy and paste this because I'm a lazy writer. Connect. And we use the signal name. The signal names I've um, documented here. So if you go down on the original, go to PlayFab repository, I have a user guide. Here's connecting signals. So we have a couple of signals that can be connected. Uh, for the login, I always recommend these two, API error and server error to be connected, and then the logged in here. We're also going to register implicitly an anonymous user, but we, we don't care. We just care for the logged in event for now. OK. Um, that also kind of leads me real quick, a uh, quick side note, um, why I'm using this static instance is you can also just drop a PlayFab client um, into the scene here and use that. Um, the reason I'm not doing it, it is because I want to handle these kinds of errors globally, right? Otherwise, I would have to handle this or connect it to, to each individual um, instance here. Um, you can have as many instances of, of PlayFab client in your scenes as you want, and in fact, you sometimes want to because one of these instances can only handle one HTTP request to the REST API of PlayFab at once. That is kind of a limitation um, that I can only save with Godot 4 now, but I haven't solved it just now. Um, so this is going to be worked on in the future. But it's very rarely that you need um, multiple um, requests at the very same time, you can also queue them in a way. So now we we connect uh, these. Oh, we can also bind um, bind a method. Actually, I like to define functions individually. We can also use um, use lambdas now, but I prefer. Uh, actual implementations, because it's clearer here. So let's do this. Um, we have a result, which is a login result. Um, and we just manipulate here the, the label. And here comes a cool feature. I can just, if I don't remember, I can just pull this in. And to log in. Also, going to set uh, 
the color to, to green because we like that. So we click this. Uh, we want to do a theme override. Oh, I need to go back here. Go here. What's going on? Here we go. Um, we want to do a theme override colors font color. So there is no actual property exposed, but we can set a property via a setter. So we just do this again because I'm lazy. Set the property name and then green web. Web green. That's the color I want. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Then we're also going to copy and paste this and do this for the other errors. A error. Server error, which we're going to handle with our own methods. Are we gonna do the error message here? Print this to the console, and we do the very same thing for the error. Okay, so let's test this. We're logged in now. Fantastic. Alrighty, uh, so we got this, and now we are going to um, send some telemetry events. And we're going to do this whenever someone clicks that button because we want to know how often one of these buttons is being clicked on, right? So for that, we're going to drop a play fab event into the scene. Hang on. That's weird. I'm sorry. Maybe this is a problem. Sometimes, like, this is something that happens more often in Unity than in Godot. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so we add this here. So we can just we can make this also scene unique. Uh, we go to the script and we can just do that. So whenever we click on the dogs, uh, the dogs, we want to send an event, right? Um, so let's first implement a function to send an event. Um, and we're gonna say which animal. And maybe also the count because we want to have payload. So we div spell event. This is how you spell event. So we're gonna define a payload at the dictionary and so see how easy this is. I love GT script. So we give it, uh, we also define an event name, animal count, or animal votes better, because we're voting for animals. And then we're gonna use the play event to write Come on, autocomplete. complete. 
This is sometimes when they had script errors. Kind of bugs out. I'm gonna use the, the dollar now. Maybe it's a it's a problem of the of the scene unique name. Uh, hang on. Uh, so we're gonna paste in the event name, the payload, and and have a lambda that um, ends, uh, the like a confirmation, right? Um, when it's uh, when it's returning. So let's see. It's funny. I don't get the autocomplete here, so I can't uh, show it to you. Uh, but essentially, the lambda is is upon finish, upon the event is sent, right? Um, the playfab event class is written in a way that it automatically batches events, um, so you don't like spend the API cycles on it and, and pay for them, um, because you you essentially pay a like a, a micro center or something per per API use. Right? So I'm exaggerating, but very little um, if you're not in the free free tier or in the free limits. Um, so let's send an event. Whenever. You click one of these buttons. Let's get started here. Uh, open the play stream monitor. This is where this all comes in. Oops. Uh, okay. So we should see this coming in here. Gonna vote for cats. And you see this coming in. And if I clip this multiple times, these will come in multiple times, but I will only send them once um, in, in one batch in, in a flush uh, when, the, when the play stream buffer is flushed. We also, I like cats more, so that's why I'm going to click cats more often. Uh, and we can see here the the payload here, if we click on it. And if we go back to the Data Explorer, so we had, I think it was a total of 100 records. Uh, we, No, there's not a hundred records. Well, you get the point. It's it's a little bit delayed, right? So, um, oops, it's a little bit delayed. Um, it's the right one. Let's select those. Oops. Oh. Double equals. Oh. So that's that. So yeah, um, you can. Oh, that's a little bit bad with the huge resolution here. I can't really show this here. Um, yeah. You can actually see the whole uh, payload in here as well. So yeah, that's uh, that's about it. I don't know uh, how I'm doing time-wise, um, but that kind of make, marks the end of my presentation. And if you have more questions, do let me know. You can always uh, contact me at any one of those social platforms and primarily Twitter. So thank you very much for having me. 
Very, very cool talk. Uh, I know Godot is hot right now in terms of uh, people looking at it and trying to support it and do those things. So this has been like a pretty awesome talk. Um, we do have several questions uh, specifically around GD script and like C sharp. Um, yeah. Does Godot Playfab like help folks that maybe want to write their Godot games using C sharp? Can they still use the uh, asset that you created? Um, for C sharp, no, not directly. So this is specifically um, aimed at a GD script. But the cool mm -hmm. thing is with Godot, you can actually use both languages, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it it can be a bit tricky to to use both in the same in the same project, right? But you can yeah. totally do it, right? But you know there is a C sharp SDK for it. Um, you should use that, right? Uh, it mm -hmm. might not be as straightforward um, in terms of some of the usability features. Um, but, but it's good, right? Yeah. And I, I think that's a good point. You know, it's like, if you're using C sharp, use the C sharp specific SDKs and libraries. Like that's the whole reasoning behind you picking say C sharp over GD script. So absolutely. Uh, yes. It's a really good point. Uh, yeah. Fedor, do you have any questions you want to ask? Yeah, we have some questions. One of them is. Uh, do you cover the whole uh, API interface of uh, PlayFab uh, with Godot PlayFab? PlayFab? Yeah, so a good question because that is that is a huge undertaking. Like uh, it's a really big API. You have to understand that there is not only a client API and an event API that I just showed. There is also a server side API and an administrative API that you kind of use from the back end. So it can do a little bit more. Right. And as a single person, I cannot cover it. I don't want to generate anything. Uh, but also the API is very straightforward. And given GD script is super straightforward, right? Um, and it, basically what you need to do, uh, because I also did like the authentication, the background cache and everything, there's a very, very simple call that basically says, uh, go with authentication, make requests with authentication, and you just put in a path and, and a payload as a dictionary. Right. Um, it's it's super simple to mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. You you mentioned specifically like uh, Azure PlayFab has that user limit, like the free tier and then the paid tier. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about user counts. Is that specific to user profiles created in your Azure PlayFab uh, title, or is it yep. active users per month? So like if you have active churn in your game. Um, does that is that more the user or is it just someone creates an account and that's automatically a user oh, it's an it, it's in fact those accounts that uh, that you saw earlier right when i demoed mm -hmm. it um so for each account that that is being created you go closer to that limit right mm -hmm. um so um once you have hit that limit no one can sign up anymore mm. for your title so that's why it's so important before you actually go launch your title to make this production, right? But it doesn't matter in terms of pricing because um, the free tier is still inclusive of that, right? Or mm -hmm. it's still inclusive of the free tier, right? So you mm -hmm. don't pay for the same thing, right? Uh, but it enables you to to grow out of that. But arguably with 100,000 users, you should be profitable, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. Like, uh, but there's a lot of free to play games. Yeah, so indeed, some, indeed. sometimes, you know, you can get into a situation where like uh, a good example is probably like vampire survivors like exploded. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like that, that might be like a tricky situation for a lot of folks. So, yeah, um, but I don't think they have money problems either. <laughs> yeah, I think I think they're doing fine. Uh, yeah, for sure. I've wasted I've wasted hours on Vampire Survivors. So, uh, but uh, you know, a, a, another interesting question with PlayFab, like obviously the API is expansive. There's a ton of features that people could kind of opt into. What do you think are like the most obvious ones for people to gravitate towards and actually put in their games like because there's a lot there but like what are the core ones that you think people should be using that those are the ones that i talked about in in my presentation is really the data um mm -hmm. the data aspect for for analytics for balancing variables and then the experiments that that is basically what every single game should be using in fact right Mm -hmm. I, I I personally, as a consultant, would not understand if you're not using it, right? Because you you're missing out, right, uh, on so many opportunities in in optimizing your workflows, right? Um, the other things is like really automation. I didn't 
show this because uh, I can make it quickly. I think we have a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. um, so you, uh, where's the share button? I'm sorry. This is not Teams. I work with Teams every day. <laughs> I, I, I can't, I'm sorry. I can't find it anymore. It's It's gone. It's not oh, on the page anymore. Oh, that's Weird. okay. No worries. Uh, anyways, uh, so you can, um, Essentially, you can have Cloud Script, so Azure Functions um, that that you um, create on on the Azure platform, right? Um, and these are very small programs that you can upload, like in C Sharp, and you can actually trigger um, those with events, with PlayStream events, for example, and and react to to those events. Um, mm -hmm. Like if a player churns, right? Uh, you can send them an email if you're really obnoxious, right? <laughs> and uh, or when someone hasn't logged in for a long time, you can give them an item or things like that, right? Uh, and that I think is really great in, in, in a world where we where we have longer term games going on, right? That you need to to kind of like post sales monetize in order to make them a commercial success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are those are really, really good points. Um, and yeah, and uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, one other thing is leaderboards. Mm -hmm. um, in sometimes in the API, you can also um, hear them uh, uh, talked about as as uh, statistics. They are a fantastic thing to misuse, right? It's basically a table storage, right? And you can that you can rank, and that's a fantastic thing to misuse as a, a data storage. So to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's interesting too because a game that comes to mind that. Like you were saying, PlayFab isn't just for multiplayer games or massively multiplayer games like yeah. uh, your Diablos or, you know, like just uh, Warcraft and those kind of games. But uh, recently I've been playing Street Fighter VI and the first screen you see when Street Fighter VI comes up is Azure PlayFab. Yes. And a one-on-one -on -one game like Street Fighter yeah, it has leaderboards, it has balancing, like a lot of things you mentioned uh, in yeah. this talk. So like backend as a service feels really, really important for any type of game that you're creating. Uh, a question somebody had, which I think kind of relates to what we're talking about, when you're working with smaller studios or AAA studios, like have you noticed um, any difference in kind of their like, uh, development style and has PlayFab kind of helped equal the playing field for a lot of these kind of studios? In, in a way, right? Um, I mean, you, you certainly notice from the C Sharp world, right? Um, how, how like well equipped kind of like um, developers are in, in terms of backend development, right? That's mm -hmm. not a thing in the games industry at all, right? Um, in mobile, yes, people are. Uh, well equipped to build backends because they are so ad heavy and everything, right? And have always been. The the AAA games industry and also in these uh, are kind of caught up in this. Um, we want to make a game, right? That's what they have always been doing, right? And there is literally no experience in building backends, right? Even with the big ones, only the very big ones um, do have that expertise. And 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 so this is totally lo uh, leveling the playing field, right? Because whether you're big or small, all of them are using PlayFab or other competitors in that field, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think OLS in our previous talk mentioned Firebase too as like a potential yeah. other option. Um, but you know, yeah, you're... indeed, yeah. indeed, it's funny you mentioned that because there is a Firebase plugin for Godot, and I'm kind of good friends with the maintainer of that, and we we actually wanted to do a a talk together at the GodotCon, which is happening here in Munich. Which I'm co-organizing, by the way. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, he c couldn't come, but that would have been fantastic, right? Because we're we're essentially doing the same thing, right? And, mm -hmm. and it's really about helping game developers continue concentrating on making a great game rather than building a backend, right? That's mm -hmm. all it is. Yeah, that's uh, that's excellent. Like, I, I think it's nice to see two essentially like competing services and uh, like asset authors still collaborate. And the main goal is to make sure developers get their games out there, help people find the fun in kind of building games and playing those same games. So I think that's really admirable of you. And uh, thank you. yeah, thank you. It's it's also a lot of fun, and you know, you can learn a lot from each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess uh, here's another question. 
Uh, we saw you kind of structure your uh, events, right? For uh, I'm a dog person. So when you were clicking cats, I, know, I was like, I, know, I, was, I, know. I was slowly I dying. Did it. <laughs> I, I was just doing it for you. Got it. <laughs> uh, but uh, is there a way like to structure your events? Uh, I noticed you were sending the state of the count every time. So like the, it, the state was being managed in your game. Um is that the best way to do it? Is it better to kind of send the events and kind of compile them using that KQL uh, query language that's on the Azure side? Yeah. Like, What are some recommended approaches there? Uh, I mean, for events, sending the actual count is probably not good because that is what I would have been doing in a, in a leaderboard. I just wanted to show that you can send this kind of payload, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you, you would track the numbers actually in a leaderboard and you would probably write the leaderboard from a server side, right? Because otherwise everyone's going to cheat on you. And uh, and so you kind of want to send as a payload the data that you're interested in. And that is a hard question to answer, right? Because mm -hmm. it really depends. Um, for, for that and just counting how many clicks you have on each um on each one of these, you wouldn't need a payload at all, right? Mm -hmm. Because you would just count the, the, or maybe just the animal name, right? And then do this in KQL and analyze how many dogs and how many cat mm -hmm. button clicks there were, right? Yeah, I can tell you're a consultant because you use the magic phrase, it depends. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fedor, do you have uh, any other questions that you've seen kind of come in uh, from chat? Uh, I think that we have one more question and quite important nowadays. It's uh, that by using PlayFab, uh, one is collecting user data and um, is PlayFab GDPR compliant? I'm not a lawyer, so uh, it's hard for me to answer this, right? Uh, so <laughs> take it with a grain of salt, but it's you who makes a GDPR compliant, right? It's always dependent on the, on the data that you collect. PlayFab does collect PII by default, right? Like the, um, I think PII is an IP address, right? And that is collected. You saw, you saw it geolocating me to my hometown, right? Which is, in fact, I think PII, right? So um, you need to definitely ensure that you have the the right kind of disclaimers in your game. Like when you do a website or whatever, right? When you use analytics, you kind of need to tell people about that, right? And uh, so you can make this opt-in or not, mm -hmm. right? And um, it's it's really on you. And you need to make sure that you're also deleting user data when it when you get a request for that, right? So it really depends on you, but it can be. Let's, mm -hmm. let's say it that way. Um, yeah, it's great that we had so much uh, time for for questions. I think uh, I I you know how it is in life in in the real world. You time it all the time on forty five minutes, and then you rush through this in like half the time. So. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, there's a lot of good Sorry stuff there. Uh, I shared some of the links uh, to your repo, uh, so folks can kind of go check that out. Uh, you know what? One more question for you, because I was like when I was watching. I'm I'm a more of a business developer. I'll admit it. I'm on the game. I'm on game dev hosting duty, but I'm more of a business person. Um, uh, hopefully, people don't rush me out of here. No, um, no, but uh, <laughs> a question I had, you know, like with PlayFab, you can kind of keep track, especially if you're building MMOs. You can keep track of your game's economy. Uh, are there ways to kind of set anomaly detection so that? If something happens where there's an exploit based on your economy, you can kind of be notified that something bad is happening. Like someone's duplicating gold. Like if you're a Diablo player, you remember that uh, gold duplication trick, right? Everyone's used yeah. that. This is like kind of on 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 you right now, as far as I know. There is mm -hmm. there is some additions to the economy being made, but I'm not sure that there is a new feature that would enable that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure there are there are a couple of uh, best practices that I'm just not aware of. I'm sorry. Oh no, but no, yeah, that's... no. It's a it's a it's a it's a really good question. Yes, uh, indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, well, and I'm I... and I'm kind of sure it's 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 gonna be solved in a way because you know Microsoft Flight Sim is using it, Minecraft, uh, right? Uh, by the way, single player games, 
Uh, mm -hmm. They also use it for for mod management, by the way, uh, which you can also do it as well. Yeah. Um, a another thing you mentioned in the talk, I think, is like, you know, whenever you have to deploy to platforms like Xbox or PlayStation, you potentially have to pay a fee to kind of like publish a few patches, right? But you mentioned that you can change things in your game by using Azure PlayFab um, that maybe can help you reduce the cost of operating your game. Um, yep. what, what are some kind of things that make sense to kind of handle through PlayFab versus just doing a complete patch release or uh, update yep. to your game? So the famous commit we did back in the day was improved luck right? <laughs> for a random generator. Because yeah. like luck is perceived very differently. And mm -hmm. so a a like kind of chance of like for 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 loot to drop on a on a specific enemy, for example, is a very good thing that you should be controlling from the back end, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have to change this all the time. Um if you look at um also look at games like Diablo, most of the changes they do is actually balancing, right? It's not like content, it's balancing that they are changing. So mm -hmm. if you can do this without a client release, that saves you so much time and, and, and money and resources and, and can make uh, the community a lot more happy. Yeah. That's another thing is maybe, I don't know, um, like the actual drop value or the value of a, of a specific item or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, especially if you're having like weekend events or something like that, where you want to kind of engage your user base and want to give them like more for kind of playing during a certain time. I think that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. So. Or like Halloween sub, right? Um, you already patched this in like in March, right? And then in like just before Halloween, you enable this when you do your marketing event around mm -hmm. that right so you just flip a, uh, a switch in playfab and you have this running in your game right mm -hmm. and yeah, that's, also that's kind cool. of unlock additional items that you want to want to drop and things like that right? yeah i mean we're doing a halloween event here i love i love kind of the game dev theme this year so uh <laughs> yeah it's, it's pretty cool uh so yeah uh fedor do we have any more questions or um should we I, our... I should I should so I think they should proceed to the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm well, sorry. <laughs> oh no, no. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you very you... much for the for the conversation. So I really enjoyed that. Yeah, thank and, you. Uh, so thank much. you very much for having me. Yeah. Uh, Have a good one. Yep. Bye, Giannis. Uh, uh, oh, I'm bye. sorry. Bye. Uh, was it too quick? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Uh thank you so much. We really enjoyed this talk. Uh chat was great. Uh, we enjoyed this conversation. So we'll Lovely. see you next time and uh, have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Thank bye you. Bye.